Greetings, everyone. I'm excited to welcome Bilal Therese, co-founder and CEO at BOA. Bilal, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, oh. great. Great to have you here. Yeah, let's dive right in. Tell us a little bit about your background. So actually, I, I don't really have a SaaS background or let's say this, this SaaS background is not that old. Mm -hmm. Originally, I did an apprenticeship as a mechanic. Uh, on huge two-stroke diesel engines for container ships and so on. Then I studied uh, economics and in the meantime, unexpectedly, I took over the family business when I was 24 years old. And a few years ago, I wanted to solve all problem within the company. And that's where my SaaS background actually started. Oh, really? Yeah. Interesting. So diesel mechanic to family business, now starting your yeah. own, own endeavor and, and business. Yeah. And, and so, so your background was you, like you said, the apprentice schooling was in, in the, in mechanics or repairs. Yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. absolutely. The family business was, or still is, is in, in household appliances, mm -hmm. so service and replacement and kitchen building. So some other different stuff far away from sauce, but then just the problem came up and that's transformation of myself. Yeah. And I, I was looking at your profile and background. So it was really interesting, the transition of your, your history to now what you do now. So look forward to diving in. So perfect transition. Tell us a little bit about the products and services that Flowit offers. Actually, we, we offer a Gen AI powered digital coach for people development. So we, we cover all the different disciplines within people development, which is the royal discipline of HR. So we are not going into the direction of an HRAS system, recruitment or, or payrolling and so on, but we really help our customers to engage their people but not only on the, on the office side, but also when it comes to frontline workers, especially when it comes to them, because those population was overlooked many years. And those are exactly the ones that are short all the time in the restaurants, in the service fields, healthcare sectors, and so on. And companies invest millions and billions of dollars into recruitment and, and more recruitment and more, but to just stop churn makes much more sense, but to reach out to the frontliners, it's quite difficult. And that's where we tackle on and, and uh, have developed some different modules to really get a foot in there and, and take them onto the journey of digitalization and, and personal development for themselves as they can really also decide for themselves where to go and not just receive orders from top down. In, in these target specific industries then for your digital coach? Yeah, we focus on, on healthcare sector, manufacturing service, field service sectors and hospitality. So hotels and, and restaurant chains are often customers. But we do also have some completely different clients, but from our perspective, if we do outreach, then it comes to more or less the sectors that I mentioned before. Okay. And could you give us a, an example in one of these industries, whether, I don't know, a front desk manager at a hotel, or I don't know, in healthcare, if this is, you know, nurses or who this be applicable, but do you have kind of a use case you could provide an example? Yeah. I mean. A, a very easy use case. If you take some, some employee surveys, normally a company is doing that maybe once or a year or every second year with flow it, they do it very often, but in a very short and, and efficient way, we do have it auto translate so that also the Chinese chef in the kitchen of a Chinese restaurant can take place and, and give their opinion into the survey back to the HR and management as, as it is really difficult to, to reach out to them and take mm -hmm. their wishes and, and opinions into consideration for, for further business development. 
the, okay. the very easy way or example how we how we include them. Okay, okay. So that chef, you'd be able to reach out to them. So is this just checking on the 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 pulse of the frontline workers? So checking in more often. How is it going? And then from there, is there any? I don't know, not say proactive, but then, you know, if they're, if say whoever's, I guess, yeah, then who is, once those surveys go out, you get the pulse of the employees, the frontline workers, who is that coming mm -hmm. back to? Is it like a chief people officer that then they see this and then they can take action on the responses? Actually, we give our platform into the hands of all the leaders, of course, and his team or her team is often the super admin as well as the sea level, but they really get the information from every level on the company back. So you can also filter the AI reports on team division and, and the whole company and so on and everything between that, so that you have a very clear view, uh, what is going on in my division as a division leader, what is going on in my team as a team leader or as a CEO. What is going on? Where are the pain points in my company, which, which I'm leading. And then often the, the customers get so much more insight because we use AI for reports and dashboards instead of just the old school numeric questions. Um, because if you give me a seven on a question, I don't know, is it seven for you good or is it not that good? In a rating from one to 10. So with um, our LLMs, we are of course able to um, take so much more out of the answers from everybody and consider that into uh, some, some correlations and so on. So in the end, it comes to a lot of tips, how you can proceed as a company, what is possible to change on the short, middle and long term, where are the biggest pain points also with which questions you could go into the next poll survey right away that you don't have kind of a report 100 pages long, and then you have to think about in a big workshop or with a consultant, which is external often, okay, what should we do now with the results? So we give the tool into the hands that they can really act instead of react and also take all of these inputs into action items when it comes to performance reviews, learning, development goals, and so on, skill management. So we go then and connect all the pillars, our modules of people development with each other and try to leverage everything from, from the beginning on. Okay. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. And when you're trying to land a prospect, are you trying to initially say cover the entire employee base or maybe just land and expand, get a certain part of the employee base, those chefs that then maybe we work on to the wait staff and so on? It, it's a little bit different. Um, it, it is different when it comes to the customer type, big mm -hmm. size of, of the organization, of course. Um, but also where the company stands in, in question of culture, uh, leadership, and so on. Um, normally we try really to roll out over all employees because that is exactly what they never had before with the other tools like SAP Workday, uh, SurveyMonkey and so on, because they could not include the front lines. So it's the very first time that they have the whole population of employees on one platform, on one report and one AI dashboard. And when it comes to that, it's more like the question, do we go in with many modules or do we get the foot in the door with one or two and then expand? Mm -hmm. Normally it's like this, that we start with two modules on average and then expand to the uh, third and the fourth. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. And, and one last question around the, the product and, and prospecting, it, is this any employee size or is, it, is this better suited when you have hundreds, thousands of employees for your product? 
We focus at the moment as we are doing direct sales on companies from 100 employees to 15,000. Okay. Just for the moment and also in respect to the team size that we are at the moment, that we can really serve our customers and customer success on a very high level. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Appreciate that insight. And let's talk some, some stats now. When did you, what year did you found flow it? That was in December, 2020, but we went on the market with, with flow it as, as our go live in September, 21. So actually three years from now back. Okay. Okay. Went to market September, 21. And then do you have a headquarters location? Yes. It's in the area of Zurich. Okay. Um, Okay. Right All right, Zurich. And what's your current team size? A little bit more than 30 people. Okay. And then anything you want to share around scale or ARR ranges or revenue ranges? Yeah. I mean, we are at the moment between one and three million ARR in that range. Okay. Okay. Appreciate it. And, and then, so let's switch over to the, the fundraising side. Looks like you raised a 4.2 million. It's looks like characterized as a pre-seed round. So tell us in this journey, like where, so went to market, you know, so founded late 2020, went to market September, 2021. And then mm-hmm. where in the journey did you have that pre-seed raise? Hmm. I mean, we were bootstrapped until the end of August when we okay. closed around. So totally bootstrapped. It was also not a trigger of run out of cash. We got profitable by end of last year. Already we do have many long year contracts. So in, in the average, our customers close their initial contract on, on a three years basis and pay nearly two years in advance. So cash was not really the problem. It is more like having enough speed mm-hmm. on the pedal to be always ahead of, of our competitors. And that was the, let's say when we realized, okay, we, we need to go for fundraising. We had this idea already previously, it was, let's say one and a half year ago, but then the, the VC market, the capital market was that cold. So we decided to skip a year and, and just run for our metrics and then to develop even further and then go for a bigger round. So initially we planned around one, 1. 1.5 million. Mm-hmm. And then with the skip of a year, we target on the 3 million Swiss francs. So a little bit more than 8.1, I think in euros. And in the end, it was oversubscribed with, with 4. 4.0 Swiss million Swiss francs. Yeah. Okay. So it's 4.4 uh, 4 million Swiss francs. And yeah. so your journey, you know, so went to market August 21 and, or sorry, late or September 21. So bootstrapped for about three years. And then you mm-hmm. said you were profitable and then wanting more speed, which makes a ton of sense. But, and then in, say in your operations, did you see other triggers that just said we're ready for capital if it was product market fit or sales cycle or, you know, the, the, I don't know, what, what did you see there that said, you know, it looks like we could use some more capital now. Market fit was never really a question as it came up from own pain points. So that fit was given from the very first second. We also do not have any pilots, POCs or so, all of our customers are paying regular customers and and therefore it it was really to, to now shift one gear up and, and really run even faster as we do have many USPs compared to others and we don't want to lose them as especially also the big players coming with new ideas and, and we need to be just three steps ahead always. So it, it was not really a need. Of course. I mean, we had two less people a year ago. I, I remember we were six. So by, by last July 24, we were already 
25 people from our own bootstrap mm-hmm. capitalization. So of course we ramped up the team, but we had even two less people for all the work, but it was a balance that we had to hold. So mm-hmm. that's of course some reason too for uh, get the, get the fundraising done. And then at this stage, you're, you're a couple of years in profitable, want to run faster and then say, you know, revenue generating and maybe say at least a million ARR and you know what, so really interesting then breaks that pre-seed round, what lessons, any lessons that you learned in that pre-seed raise that you'd like to share with other founders who are kind of in that same stage of developed the product, went to market, generating some revenue, now thinking about a seed round. So you mean why, why we skipped this pre-seed or? No, just, no, just like kind of any lessons in that fundraise of raising oh, the 4 million. Overall. Swiss, yeah. Overall, what, what you learned in okay. that process. I would say there are three points mm-hmm. I could mention and, and give to others in, in that stage. You need more time than you expect, but I think everybody tells you that it can always happen that something unexpected occurs. For example, we had actually our lead investor and the signed term sheet. Uh, the negotiation was pretty straightforward, but then we reached out to potential co-investors. We had some that were just like, okay, we accept everything and we, we go with you because you're just, yeah, we just follow. That was great. So we had always a plan B, but then it came up that there was a potential co-investor, which actually leads always their, their round. And, and then we had, of course, kind of, yeah, we do have the lead investor. We have the term sheet. So, okay, let's discuss a few topics again, which were already done, but not too much. And and in the end you think, okay, it makes sense in our case, because both of our investors actually series A investors. So for the long run, it is very beneficial for me if I cover a, a big part of this next series already with the existing one and have the network and their capabilities for, for later on and, and other investors and network. So in the end, we had two times the lead negotiation, more or less. That was of course time consuming, but absolutely worth it. And my last tip I would say is fill your VC pipeline with twice as many potential investors. So you, uh, it doesn't thin out during the process and it is easier to align all the potential investors on the same timeline. If you have to fill a second bottle in there, then you have some already near to the finish line and others on the starting line. And that's, that's hard to manage. Yeah. Appreciate that insight. So one always takes more time than you expect and then fill your pipeline. And then I, I'm glad you mentioned that last point about the timeline because that has come up, but I don't think it comes up enough of, of running the process. On, like you said, on that same timeline, here's the schedule, here's when we kick off, here's when we want to close. So everyone is in on that same timeline. So yeah, appreciate, appreciate that insight. So Bilal, at this stage of your journey, do you have a favorite number or metric that you're focused on to guide the business? I have two or three. Mm-hmm. One of them is the NR. Another one for us as in, in B2B sauce, which is very relevant as we do have not, I mean, our customers do not close and then activate tomorrow or right now via credit card, the amounts are too big. So we go with CAR and then in the end, of course, the ACV, uh, which decides your capabilities in the end of sales teams and, and Cox and, and so on. So these three are like looking forward, but looking also back and then your current stage are very relevant for me. I love it. So yeah, first net revenue tension, you said, then second, you said car. So contracted or committed annual current revenue. 
which is a popular metric when you do, like you said, you sign a contract, but it doesn't go into revenue right away. You kind of have that backlog, but it's building your ARR amount and then ECV. So yeah, great metrics. Love those. And, and net churn, right? And, and churn. CIR yeah. CIR is net churn. Yeah. Yes. Net, mm -hmm. net of churn. So yeah. So appreciate that. I love that. And then Bilal, Bilal, really appreciate your time today as we wrap up. What's coming up next for Flowit? We'll drive our expansion into the German market as well in, as into the Nordics. Um, before we go even further, we do have big plans. So also the Americas are, are a, is a goal in our view, but as we also do have a very strong network within our investor scope and, and, mm -hmm. and also from, from our personal network itself, um, the German market is the first step. And in parallel, the, the Nordics, uh, where yeah. they are very open for new, uh, tools and, and innovations, uh, and reached out many companies to us by themselves. So that's how we go. Well, that's great. Great to hear. Always exciting. So German Nordic markets, then the Americas. So that's, that's exciting. So Bilal, again, really appreciate your time sharing your journey today. If listeners would like to learn more about Flowit, where should we send them online? Just go on flowit.ai. There is our new website, always open to also stay in contact via LinkedIn. Just, just search my name. Yeah. But otherwise website is always good. All right. Well, perfect. So listeners, if you'd like to learn more about Bilal and his journey at Flowit, check out flowit.ai to learn more. And again, really appreciate your time and, and sharing your experiences today. Yeah. Thank you.